Oh, but before I start, I just wanted to do a little bit of advertising. Um, if you're interested in applying some of the things that Alex was talking about to the real world, we're running this eight-week course, which is really about learning to take academic knowledge and apply it to the real world, because that involves a whole bunch of skills that don't get taught at universities anyway. So um, in terms of uh, the SKA, the precursor is a thing called Meerkat. How many people have heard of Meerkat, just out of curiosity? OK, great. So this is uh, an old photograph. Um, you can see 16 dishes. The 64 dishes are now up and running. We had a kind of integration last week, which is very exciting. And it's a precursor to the main, uh, main event, which is the square kilometer array, which will look something like that. There'll be thousands of dishes spread all over Africa and Australia. The phase one, which will happen around 2025, uh, will be a 10% of the square kilometer array, which is 650 million euros. And then phase two will be much bigger, to, well, 10 times bigger and probably 10 times the cost. And the cool thing about it is that the data rate for the SK will be around an exabyte a day. So it's quite hard to imagine that. Um, it's a thousand petabytes or a million terabytes a day. And the other thing is that it should run for about 50 years if humans are still around, which I'm, I'm not completely sure about. But the SKA may be running even if there's no humans around. So um, just a bit of radio astronomy to help you. Why do, we, why do we want so many thousands of dishes? The thing that that allows is it allows very high angular resolution pictures. So this is actually cat data, uh, from Meerkat data. On the, all these pictures are the same object but just as you add more dishes. And you can see that on the top left, you have a kind of blurry image. The top right is a bit better. And then the bottom left is even better. And well, the, the projector is not very good. But this is with 16, and you get a, a, a nice image. And then if you spread them across the entire African continent, you get incredible resolution. So that's one of the advantages of, uh, doing, of having not just one big dish. Of course, you can't make a dish um, huge. So in fact, that's another reason why we need lots of dishes. But you may have heard about another interferometer that's very popular in the news. The LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, a couple of years ago, they discovered gravitational waves, big discovery. And they also were using interferometers, except they had a very simple interferometer. It was just two two interferometers, one on the west coast of the states, one on the east coast. And then the key idea is that when a wave comes in, it takes, it arrives at the different stations at slightly different times. And that time delay gives you information about where it came from. And as you add more and more of these dishes or receivers, you are able to localize uh, the signal better and better. So that's what they saw at the Gravitational Wave Observatory. Um, top left is uh, what they saw at one, top right is what they saw at another, with a 0 0.007 second shift. And that's the light travel time for the light to go across America, basically. So seven challenges I'd like to put to you and challenge you to think about solving. Um, the first is data wrangling. The second is data cleaning. Then uh, the internet of telescope things. Then scheduling, discovering the hidden Nobel Prize, the quest to be both sensitive and unbiased, and then finally, AI scientists. So we'll go through that. Feel free to uh, jump in at any point. So uh, there, is a, there is a kind of context to this, which is that every big science experiment is going through a little bit of an identity crisis because AI is going to revolutionize the world. And the question is, how do scientists respond to that? How, what does it mean to do the SKA for 50 years when we may have super inte superhuman intelligence in 50 years? So you know, there's this big uncertainty, and there's this very interesting kind of tussle and tension going on about you know, how do we integrate new technologies like AI into traditional science activities. And to kind of put uh, the best example of that, I think, is the game of Go. I'm sure 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this example. 2016, the world champion, famous uh, Lee Sedol, was beaten 4-1 by uh, AlphaGo, the Google DeepMind program. There's a great documentary on Netflix called AlphaGo, uh, which I highly recommend, mostly because you see the emotional turmoil that this causes the humans. Shame. They, they start off like, yeah, I'm going to win 5-0, and then he gets crushed. And you know this emotional path that this champion goes through, and he feels this pressure because he's fighting for humanity, you know, and then, then he loses. <laughs> but the amazing thing is, last year, AlphaGo, uh, you know, DeepMind kept working on this, and they produced a better version of AlphaGo, which they called AlphaGo Zero, and that beat AlphaGo 100 nil. And then they were like, oh yeah, but wait, we can do better, and so they, they, they changed it, and then the new version of AlphaGo Zero beat the old version of AlphaGo Zero 100 nil. So what you have is hu best human, AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero first version, AlphaGo Zero second version. And it's 100 nil, 100 nil, 4-1. So, you know, this context of just how quickly computers can rank, uh, ramp up and become better than us, you know, is particularly relevant for this 50-year thing. So, okay, first challenge, data wrangling. How do you deal with the one exabyte of data a day? So you can do kind of back-of-the-envelope calculations. That's about 10% of all the information produced by humanity before the year 2000. And that's um, very relevant to data scientists because, you know, it's very, it's very popular to say that data science is the sexiest job of the century, and I think that's a very bad analogy. I think a much better analogy is to say that it's a Cinderella career. And, and you might be thinking, well, hmm, why is that? Well, the key thing to remember is that Cinderella spent most of her life scrubbing floors. Or, and she had one night of glory, right? And that's very similar. And when you've got exabytes and exabytes of data, that's a lot of cleaning, right? So the second problem is, uh, is in fact, data cleaning. So imagine that you're in a busy cocktail party and lots of people are talking around you and you're trying to eavesdrop on a conversation in a different country. It's tough, right? But in fact, that's a pretty good analogy for what radio astronomers are trying to do because these telescopes, the SKA and Meerkat, will be able to detect a cell phone signal on Alpha Centauri. But of course, we live on Earth where everybody has a cell phone, right? So it's very similar to that thing of trying to hear a very distant conversation while in a room full of people talking. So here's an example. So um, on the x-axis you've got time and on the y-axis you've got a, a part of the frequency band. And you can see there's some signals in there. The red and yellow stuff is signal. Um, in fact, all of that is, um, is noise, stuff that we don't want. The stuff at 1380 megahertz, uh, there, that's a satellite. But then you've got this weird stuff which no one, we'd never seen before. In fact, two examples of that. This is an example we need to be able to remove this first before we do the science. So one solution, as you can kind of guess, is to just... Sorry, can I... Possibly... Yes, yes, sure. Exactly. Great question. And I'm going to get to that. Um, and in fact, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, for them, this is, this is their signal, right? Uh, most, you know, so they, they're interested in, is it astrophysical or not? Is it natural or not? And if it's not natural, is it from outside our Earth? Yeah, so there's no known solution to that. And I'll come back to that. So one solution is you can just do deep learning like Alex showed. You, just get, you have a lot of examples, and then you just train it. And it does OK, but there's two problems. The first is exactly what we referred to. We wouldn't have any examples of this in our training data. So it's going to struggle to uh, identify that. A more profound question or more difficult question is that the training data is imperfect because humans can't even agree what is RFI, what is interference and noise and what is not. So let me give you an example. 
If I ask you, imagine I say, okay, take half an hour to pixel by pixel, go and mask out anything that isn't grass. Okay? So you know, the sky is easy, the trees are super easy, that's great. That everyone, all of us would agree. But then, what? About, and there's bushes, so we'll cut out the bushes. But what about this? Now, is that grass, or is it like a hedge that's sort of kind of creeping into the grass? You know, is it, it's a slightly different color. Yes, who thinks it's grass? We've got a few people. Who thinks it's not grass? Okay, so, you know, exactly. So what are we going to give the training, the algorithms to train on? Is it yes or is it no? And this is a really fundamental problem. And for things like, is it a cat or dog? It doesn't matter so much, right? But if you're really chasing either where lives depend on it or you're chasing incredibly small signals, then this could be critical. So that's the second challenge, how to clean the data to use it. The third ch interesting challenge is um, we have a huge amount of other data. You know, each antenna has a, of order a thousand sensors and they dump out a reading every 10 seconds, and we should be able to use this data to do all sorts of cool things. But what can we do with it? You know, you know, there must be cool stuff that we can do with it. So one of the obvious things is you can say, oh, let's try and predict when an antenna is gonna fail. It's like pretty bog standard Internet of Things kind of application. So you can do interesting things. You can look at the covariance matrix of the different sensors. So here, it's how similar are the, is the behavior of one sensor and another sensor just before a telescope fails. And then you can do the same covariance matrix when you're in a nominal mode, when there's no failure. And so that's what you get. So you can see there's, there's quite a big difference. So in fact, this is the difference between the two. There do seem to be nice combinations of sensors that do kind of tell you, hey, I think something's gonna go wrong. And it's not a sensor that says, something's gonna go wrong. Because you know? sometimes the, the failures can happen in unpredictable ways. So that's, I think, part of that is we have this data and we don't know quite what to do with it. You know, what are, what are cool things that we could do with it? Another problem is we have 64 and dishes, and with SKA we will have thousands of dishes, and in principle they could all look in different directions and look different targets, or they might say, let's look at this target at two o'clock in the afternoon and look at it, or look at, let's look at it at six o'clock. So it's a massive scheduling uh, problem. And then you throw in the fact that we actually want to operate this in unison with all of the telescopes around the world. Especially when something amazing happens, right? Like a gravitational wave uh, burst. When there's a gravitational wave event, we want to be able to move immediately and automatically and uh, so we need a system that can make that decision. So here's an example. Just recently there was a gravitational wave neutron star event and it was a worldwide follow-up. You know, there were 70 observatories around the world involved and you know, seven in space. But the problem was they were slow. They were quite slow. To, and it required people phoning up people in the middle of the night saying, hey, you know, can you get your telescope uh, on this object? We are, you know, the goal would be to have a system that figures actually this is important enough that we can automatically switch. And it's, you know, these, these kind of questions are very common. When my father was in ICU, I was amazed to find that they have a checklist. This is UCT Academic Hospital. They have a checklist, and what they say is, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? Is this? And then you've got points for each one of those. And then the nurse is supposed to add up the number of points. And if that number of points exceeds 30 points, then they should call the doctor. And I'm like, how, how is this not automated? Because all the data is just there on the, you know, the machines. So, um, yeah, I think this sort of thing can have huge benefits outside of astronomy. So the fifth one, which is now we start to get into the really interesting stuff, which is really where the AI kind of comes in, is Discovering the Hidden Nobel Prize. Um, so can, uh, can you find the Nobel Prize in here? There's a, a Nobel Prize in here. Oh, 
Okay, I think, I think you've probably found it, I hope. If you stay on the right. So what made that easy? It made it easy because you had an idea of what you were looking for, right? Maybe. Must be a Nobel Prize medal. Ah, okay. What about this? Okay. You know, if one of these animals walked through the door, I think we'd all probably freak out to you know, greater or lesser extents. And, and so the question is, how does a human do that? How do we as humans do that? We've never seen one of these, I'm assuming, um, before. And yet, somehow we are able to say, I've never seen it, but it's interesting. Never seen it, but it's interesting. This goes to Herman's uh, question about how do you know it's noise? How, wh why don't we as humans just go, oh no, that's, that's just an illusion. You know, it doesn't exist. It's just noise. Because at the moment, algorithms, AI, or whatever you, machine learning algorithm, has really struggle with this kind of problem. Detecting something that's never seen before, you give it an example and you want it to say, yeah, that's interesting and not noise. So in fact, it comes, uh, you can phrase it in terms of feature selection. So as Alex described, and as I'm sure many other speakers have described, you know, machine learning, either automatically or through the person who's running it, comes down to choosing some numbers or features that you're going to use to do your classification or regression. So anomaly detection, and this is essentially what we're talking about now, is easy if you choose your features well. If you choose X1 and X2 to be good features for the anomalies that you don't yet know will be in your data, or if you happen to be lucky, and this thing actually ends up standing way out there, then it's easy to detect this anomaly, right? There's lots of algorithms that will do that for you. They'll say, wow, that thing is really different from everything else. But what if you were unlucky because you didn't know how this object would be different and you chose features so that this, the anomaly lies in the middle of a cluster? Then you're definitely not going to be able to, you know, your algorithm's going to say, no, this is completely fine. No, don't worry. There's nothing unusual here. So let me give you a, a precise example. Let's take our gull shark or gar. So if we, choose, if we chose x1 to be, let's say we chose x1 to be the number of legs, it would be 2, right? So that's pretty normal. And x2, we might choose to be the average color of the animal. And that would be kind of white. And so we would end up saying our gark is actually bog standard seagull, right? It's got two legs and it's mostly white. So nothing to see here, folks, move on, right? But if we were clever or we were lucky, and instead we had chosen, instead of the average color being white, we had chosen, um, what else could we have chosen? Number of teeth, or the length of the teeth, maybe even better, then it would have stuck out like a sore thumb, um, and we would have been like, wow, that's really anomalous. The question is, if you've never seen the object, how do you know which features to choose so that when you do this, clustering, it will stay, stand out. Any suggestions? I'm going to make you work. Yeah. More features. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So you could just say, let's just throw everything at it, right? You could just say, let's, uh, uh, let's extract as much information as possible. What's the problem with that? Unfortunately, nature has been very unkind to us. There's a problem. There's a problem called the curse of dimensionality, is, and Alex sort of referred to it. In very high dimensional spaces, every point is basically equally far away from every other point. So you don't end up with this nice, naive, two-dimensional picture. Basically, you end up with a bunch of points that are all lonely, and then far away becomes kind of meaningless. So one of the huge problems with, um, with machine learning is that in high dimensions, even if you have lots and lots and lots of data, which you probably won't have, in high dimensions, 
you have this curse of dimensionality. But the other thing is the number, amount of data. As you increase the dimensionality of your data, the volume increases exponentially. So you need exponentially more data to sample well. You don't just want kind of a one pixel camera, you want lots of pixels. And so that's the problem with high dimensions. And so we're caught between this tussle between, oh, we want to add more data and more dimensions because it, um, we've got more chance of catching this, this way in which it's anomalous. But as we do that, it just gets harder and harder and harder. And another thing is that it may, uh, this object may only be anomalous in one of the dimensions. So if we have 1,000 dimensions and 999 of them look, the thing looks identical to something else, that one dimension is going to be overwhelmed and we're going to miss it. So if I ask you to design a, a trap for a new type of animal, and uh, what, what would you ask me? What questions might you ask me? How is the animal different? Great question. And I'll tell you, well, I don't know. So then you might say, well, do you have an idea of how big it is? And I say, no idea. It could be microscopic, it could be planet size. And then I don't, I don't know how many legs it's got, I don't know if it flies, I don't know what it's made of. But I still want you to make a trap. Right? Yes. What does it eat? Yeah, no idea. No idea. It might eat planets for all I know. <laughs> so, sorry? <laughs> we don't know I exactly, we know nothing. Which is truly the most exciting object, right? The most exciting animal would be one that's unlike anything we've ever seen. Yes? So, uh, I was just thinking maybe if you have a database of what other animals look like, and you compare it to all the other animals, and if you quantify maybe everything that matches the same. Great. But you still have this problem, which is your database has a certain number of features, and it may not have, for example, Let's imagine you had, uh, we discover a miniature lion. It's only this big, right? Full grown, it's only this big, right? If your feature doesn't include the overall size, you just take pictures of objects, you'll, your, your algorithm will just say, oh look, it's a lion, but quite far away, right? It just looks small. So that's the problem. Your database may not include the feature in which it's unusual. So in fact, it's an impossible problem. It's a completely impossible problem. It's, it's a variation of a thing called the no free lunch theorem, which is very important to know if you're in machine learning. You will nev almost never hear the no free lunch theorems discussed at AI conferences. Because the, uh, the no free lunch theorems say that if you know nothing about what you're trying to classify, etc., then no algorithm is better than random guessing. You can sort of see why it's not a popular theorem to bring up at AI conferences. Because it basically says, you know, you can't win in general. Okay? In the same way, if you know nothing about the animal, there's just nothing you can do better than average. And that's true also for us. So when we uh, applaud ourselves by being able to go, wow, if that walked through the door, we would know it. It's only because we've constructed examples that are very close to our heart. Uh, and our uh, domain of expertise. We could easily construct examples where humans would be, would be completely misled. Anyway, so I'm belaboring, uh, belaboring uh, the point, but it's a fascinating problem, right? Because SKA has a very good chance, and Meerkat, of having data of new classes of objects that we've never seen before, that might be worthy of an, a Nobel Prize, but we might miss it because we don't know how to look for it. So that's a pretty exciting challenge. Now, this example of the, you know, the number of legs and the length of the teeth, you might say, look, this is just an example of how algorithms are stupid, machine learning is not very clever. But this feature selection is actually everywhere in human nature and in animals. So a, a lovely example is turkeys and polecats. So polecat apparently is like that. Obviously, we don't have them in South Africa. Um, but they are mortal enemies, turkeys and polecats, you know, like superhero, supervillain stuff. And if you bring a stuffed polecat towards a turkey, the turkey goes crazy, right? 
But if you stick an, uh, you take a stuffed polecat and you stuff inside the stuffed polecat an audio recording of baby turkeys, cheep, 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 guess what happens? The turkey's like, ah, oh, my baby. <laughs> Even though it's a giant polecat that would normally eat the turkey. So the turkey is using feature selection. It's saying, audio is all I need. I'll just use one feature. If it sounds like a, if it sounds like a baby turkey, it is a baby turkey. It doesn't matter what it looks like, right? So I mean, my question now is, well, what if you took a stuffed elephant, right? You know, how, how crazy can you make it? Right? So now you're thinking, oh, well, turkeys are really stupid. Well, let's look about humans. Um, humans, we often will use one feature as a proxy for something else that's actually quite hard to measure. So black pills are a classic example, right? Black pills, they couldn't sell them at all until they made the price much higher. So they had to increase the price massively, and then they became wildly popular. Because, and there's lots of stories about this in jewelry shops uh, where people by mistake tripled the price and then sold out. When they were actually supposed to reduce the price, they got confused, salesperson got confused. Often because when you don't know what you're doing and you look at something, you know, this camera, this camera, I don't know, which one's the more expensive one? Oh, maybe that's better, right? So we use feature selection based on price, but it's a bad choice. And then my favorite is the photocopy study. This is wonderful. So they did a social science experiment in a university. They had people go to a photocopy queue when it was really busy, and, and they ran two experiments. So the first one is the person w walks up to the person and says, do you mind if I go in front of you? I need to make copies. And the person most of the time would go, uh, no, I do mind. I also want to make copies. And then they changed one word in that approach, which had a massive change in the acceptance rate. Any guesses? It's not please. So the, one, the winning thing is, do you mind if I go in front of you because I need to make copies? Yes, sure. Oh, you've got a reason. Yes, definitely. Go in front of me. The word because unlocked people's behavior in an incredible way. So that's an example of feature selection that we as humans do. We are meaning machines. We look for meanings. We look for reasons. We want to make meaning of the, of the world. We get confused. If, if things don't make sense, we get upset. But oh, it's OK. There's a reason. He wants to make photocopies. Sure, go ahead. Right? So um, yeah, so uh, that's a nice example that we all do feature selection of some sort. So, the sixth challenge is um, doing excellent science. So what does excellent science mean? I'll let you ponder that for a second. What does it mean to do excellent science? Well, I think for experimental sciences like radio astronomy, you need at least two things. The first is you need to be very sensitive. You, you want to be able to detect hard things, things that are hard to see. And the second thing is don't get things wrong. You, know, you want to be correct. So pretty obvious things. But these are actually very difficult because if we think of the SKA, one of the tasks it has is measuring the acceleration of objects on the other side of the universe because we need to know how the universe is expanding. We want to try and measure the rate at which it's uh, accelerating, etc. But this means we need to be able to measure the change in the velocity of an object on the order of a few centimeters per second squared on the other side of the universe. Right? Like, I don't think you'd be able to measure my acceleration to that accuracy just visually, like as I walk. You know, if I speed up, that's already like 30 centimeters per second squared. And now we're trying to do that at a much better precision, but on the other side of the universe. You know, we need to be able to measure the most distant objects. So it's, it's really, really hard. So, you know, going back to this, it's really easy to get things wrong. There's a many, many, any number of ways 
that we could kind of screw up that measurement. So um, one of the reasons that's bad for machine learning is it's actually very easy to fool machine learning algorithms. They're actually not very good in many ways. So here's a, a nice example of Google's API uh, applied to this image, and it gives you the what it thinks. It thinks the top uh, is a weapon, the next is a gun. Like, I'm, like is it, should it be in that order? Surely it should be the other round. It thinks it's more likely to be a weapon than a gun. I guess you could hit someone with the butt, but anyway. Anyway, so it's, it's doing perfectly well, right? And then they make a tiny change to it, and this is now the new classification. So, you know, the images are basically identical. They've just played with the background noise. And now it thinks it's a helicopter or an aircraft or a vehicle. And in fact, in the most extreme cases, you can change just one pixel and it flips the classification completely. You know? So if you have an, uh, an AI system like this in your scientific or in your medical or in your self-driving car, you don't want it to be like, I'm sorry I killed you, there was that one pixel that really put me off, right? <laughs> But in science, it's the same problem, right? We don't want to get wrong results just because the machine learning was kind of off in some crazy way. But lest you think that uh, it's just a case of computers doing stupid things, this is my favorite examples of humans doing stupid things. So this is an amazing study of the Israeli high court judge system. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about it before but I think it's worth repeating. So this is an analysis of more than a thousand parole cases and over many judges, all of whom are very experienced. So on the, on the y-axis, you can see the probability of the person getting parole. Okay, you can see it goes from zero to about 80%. And on the x-axis, there's something that's obviously very important because as you vary here, the probability of getting parole changes a lot. So from somebody who doesn't know what the answer is, any guesses as to what is on the x-axis? Sorry? Weekdays. Weekdays, a good idea, but um, no, no? Time of, day, really Time of day, that's right. And those dotted lines are lunch and tea, right? If you are the last person before lunch, you are not getting out of jail. It doesn't matter how good you've been. The judge is like, I hate you. You're staying in, right? And this is a well-known problem with humans is that as our blood sugar level drops, we get more conservative. And so as a judge, what does more conservative mean? Oh, I don't think I should take the risk of letting this person out, right? So, but if you ask those judges, they would say, no, I'm completely fair. Yeah. Interesting. I must get the references from you. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it seems like a fairly straightforward analysis to do, so I'd be interested to hear how it went wrong. But I can give you a very similar sample. I, I used to sit through hundreds and hundreds of images of the sky classifying them, and at the beginning of the night, I would be very careful. At the end, just like, whatever, whatever, I just want to get done. We humans are affected by our blood sugar level in ways that are very hard to quantify. And that's the point, is that if you try to, if you, try to uh, you know, allow for this, it's very hard. You know, if you, if you try and make it fair, let's imagine this is correct. So we take the point that it might, it might not be as drastic as this. If you say, oh, let's try and change it, how would you, change, how would you build this into the judge's system? Judge says, well, you know, I feel like it's a no, but, you know, it's just before lunch, so maybe I should change to a yes. With, a, with AI systems, it's very easy. You just run 100,000 simulations or a million simulations, you see what the effect is, and you just correct for it. So this problem of how you do... Um, science in a really unbiased way is actually very tricky because both humans and machines have problems. And, and this thing of um, humans is really interesting. So 
So Alex mentioned uh, generative adversarial uh, networks. These are networks that try to dream um, and produce things that look similar to other things it's been trained on. So one of these columns is real astronomical data, and one of them is fake dream data. And so as a kind of visual Turing test, the game is to see which one do you think is the real data? So who thinks the data on the left is the real data? You're like... I'm going to stay. Well, this is about, uh, yeah. This is the data. You can abstain if you want. Who thinks the data on the right is real data? So this is traditional. Everyone says the data on the right is the real data, and everyone's wrong. It's actually the data on the left. And I think, I, I don't know why you particularly chose the, but people are often misled by this little dot on the right here, down here. And that, that is the example of the algorithm learning that often there's little background rubbish in the images that, you know, so it's learned to be very deceptive. So you shouldn't be, uh, feel bad. The, these are called uh, fanaroff riley uh, galaxy, radio galaxy. So Bernie Fanaroff is a um, South African scientist and, and kind of politician. And I, I asked him which one was the real one, and he also got it wrong. So you mustn't feel bad. Um, but the question is, okay, so we can fool astronomers, so what? It, that's, not, that's not good enough. We, in, in chasing you know, the limits of science, we want uh, perfection. And so the question is, you know, is this good enough for, for us to use? I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of tired. So I think I'm going to skip a little bit faster and hopefully finish a bit early. Um, <coughs> Here's another example of why traditional machine learning struggles. When you've got thousands of dishes, they're all mechanical giant objects, and you tell it, point over there, they, they point over there, but they sometimes get it slightly wrong. They slightly point in the wrong direction. Okay? And that has a really big impact because uh, here's an example. So the left panel is a real uh, simulated sky, so that's the ground truth. The middle is what you reconstruct if you've got these small pointing errors, but you don't know about them. Okay, And then on the right is the difference. You can see there's a huge difference. And the problem is the telescope doesn't know it's not pointing in the right place. Right? Like if I ask you to stare at the T, the capital T on that image, some of you will look at the top. Some of you may look at the bottom. You're all telescopes right now. You're all looking at the T. Some of you might just get bored and look at the H. Yeah. How do I know what you're looking at, right? And so this is an example of the kind of challenges we face. Because if you just do machine learning, it's not going to account for those errors. So uh, what, another way to point, uh, to point this out is that when you go and calculate, when you measure stuff, like the brightness of an object, if there's a pointing error, that error will, will couple through the entire system and kind of mess things up. So uh, the answer is actually to do a principled statistical analysis. So I think one of the big trends uh, in machine learning is going to be the merger with statistics because it's the only way to really do these things properly. You need to account for the fact that Maybe your neural network is wrong. Maybe it's slightly wrong. And so we don't know yet how to put statistics and, and machine learning together properly. But I think in 20 years' time, you know, the distinction between them will be very much weaker. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. So the final and perhaps the most interesting and speculative question is, where will we ever have AI that's doing science, that's actually coming up with ideas, um, and publishing papers or something more sensible. So here are some of the questions. What does it mean to understand? Like, we may well have AI systems that make a big discovery, but will they understand what it means? And so I was thinking about this question a lot, and then I thought, okay, well, do I understand? You know, what, it, what do I mean when I say, oh, yeah, I understand? Any, <laughs> please come. Good timing. 
What? What does it mean? So any proposals, what is it? You know, I haven't got a good definition for myself. What does it mean to understand? To have a, above a certain confidence level in your predictions. Do you know about the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect? So the Dunning-Kruger effect is this amazing result that um, the less competent somebody is at something, the more likely they are to think that they're amazing, right? <laughs> I think we all know these people like, I'm amazing, and they're completely incompetent, right? So indeed, if you go back to that example we had of the, um, you know, it, this one was 78% confident that this is a helicopter. like. This is definitely a helicopter. Um, so I think confidence is, is a dangerous one, right? I mean, the etymology of the word is actually very in interesting. Understand, it sounds like, well, where would you be standing under? But the old meaning under was in the middle of. So understanding means to stand in the middle of this thing. So it's quite interesting. So if we can't even, if we don't even have a definition of understanding for ourselves, how will we know if an AI system isn't, understands, and be like, well, it's not human, so I don't think it understands. Yeah. Yeah. So another question is, does an entity have to be conscious to be truly intelligent? So far, all the examples we've had uh, suggest that this is true, but maybe it's not true. Yeah. What is real intelligence? What does general intelligence mean? The AI should get the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think that would be awesome. Well, you know, it's already 10 years since we've had the first non-human contribution to human knowledge. There's a robot called Adam. And you can watch videos on YouTube. It does these biomedical uh, experiments. It comes up with the hypothesis. It designs the experiment. It does the experiment. And then it analyzes the results and then changes the hypothesis. So it's really quite impressive. Can an algorithm be truly creative? What is, what is true creativity? You know, we have all these you know, soul-searching questions. I think, um, I think actually the game of Go, the AlphaGo thing was very interesting. In, um, in that film, they interview Lee Sedol, and he said, the computer made a move, it's game two, move 37, which was completely a surprise. No human would have done, played it. And all, at the time, all the humans were like, this is stupid, this is a complete mistake. And then as the game went on, they started to realize that it was a genius move. And that's when Lee Sudol said, this was true creativity. It was truly beautiful. And that's the first time an expert has used the word, I think, beautiful and creative for the work of, a, of an AI system. Because it's easy to be impressed. Yeah, okay, so you can, you can classify cats and dogs, so what? But to say that an expert is impressed and finds something beautiful, that's, I think that's quite profound. And so finally, the question is, will AI ever do scientific research? My own gut feeling is that the answer is yes. I think one of the problems with humans is that uh, we tend to think that whatever we do is amazing, right? We have the Dunning-Kruger effect for our own stuff. Um, and as an example, as an astronomer, we used to look at images and say whether there was a supernova in the image. And people were like, no, this can only be done by an expert astronomer. And then some people trained some ordinary, uh, ordinary amateur astronomers to do it just as well as professional astronomers. And so the professional astronomers were like, hmm, we don't like where this is going. And then, you know, relatively soon afterwards, we just trained a, a machine learning algorithm to do the same. It's actually not very difficult. So I might be wrong, but I suspect that AI will, will do scientific research, but will it understand? So, you know, we go back to that. It might discover something amazing and say, look, this is really interesting, but not be able to put it into words. So that's another question is, we often make progress by, by explaining it to each other in simple pictures. And often AI systems are not explainable. So. Interesting. So uh, for those of you who know Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose is a big fan of the idea that computers will never be conscious and never be truly intelligent. And one of his arguments 
is that the brain is not an algorithm. It doesn't follow line by line, and so don't worry. Computers will never be intelligent. But I think there's one really important uh, problem with that, is that computers are not digital. It's a lie. There are no digital computers. We've, we've imbibed this notion of a digital computer so, in, so completely that we think computers are digital. They're analog systems pretending to be digital. And they do a brilliant job, right? They're the best emulators of a digital ideal that we have. But they're not digital. They're actually analog systems. And I'll give you an example. There's this wonderful experiment in which a guy, Thompson, uh, took an FPGA, which is a kind of circuit board that can reconfigure itself, and he hooked it up to a genetic algorithm, and he closed it off, and all he wanted to do was to get the thing to tell the difference between a 1 kilohertz tone and a 10 kilohertz tone. Pretty simple. The thing ran and ran, and then it was, able to, it was doing the job. They open the box, and they look at the circuit, and you can see the circuit there. It's completely crazy. Twisted knots, cycles much smaller than the human, best human model, but kind of crazy. And so they said, oh, okay. And then what was amazing is there was a piece of the, the circuit that was doing nothing. Okay, completely separated, so they just took that out. And you know what happened? It stopped working. And they were like, wait, 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 wait. This seems to be breaking the laws of logic, right? There's this thing. It's, it's not even connected logically to the circuit board, cannot be doing anything. And then they realized it was doing something, not be at the level of the circuit diagram, but because of radio interference, because it was an analog system. So the digital kind of approximation to the system would say that's completely irrelevant, but the problem is that digital approximation broke down and the analog nature of this little component sitting off to the side became crucial. So that's an example where you know, Penrose would have said, that cannot work, and yet it does. And so you know, it would be great to have you know, Roger have his laptop and suddenly it becomes conscious and sentient. And uh, he says, but that's impossible. You know, well, you know, here I am. Yeah. And you know, when you drop your hard drive and it stops working, the digital approximation breaks down. Right? It's no longer digital. It's just a brick. So that's a very crude example. So when we, say, when we talk about digital computers, we have to be uh, very careful. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I had something to say here, but I can't remember. So thank you very much. So yes, the last thing is, you know, at the SKA, we, this data science group at the SKA is a new group. We've got lots of challenges, and we're very much looking forward to building collaboration with groups, people who are interested in working on, on all this data and all these problems. We've got lots of, lots of great problems. And I really, if there's a Nobel Prize there, I really wanted to come to South Africa. Yes. So how do astronomers feel about AI getting in astronomy? I think they fall into two camps. I first gave a talk about this about in Paris about five years ago, and a very well-known astronomer just got up and left. He was like, this is crap. Yeah. Um, now, I think people are much more aware of just how much it's coming. So people are in two camps. They're either like resisting it, like bad, 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 or they're saying, oh, well, this is inevitable. I might as well join the bandwagon. And I think that's very much human nature. And in, in, the, in the AlphaGo movie, you see it as well. As soon as they get beaten and completely destroyed by the machine, they switch over and join the machine. You know, it's like... Um, so, you know, it'll happen with humans, right? If we do have super intelligent computers that start to rule the world, there will be humans who jump ship and turn traitor, you know.
Absolutely. I think that is the future because, of course, you know, if I ask how is this going to fall, I mean, I don't need to do any experiments, uh, more or less. I've got a very good physics-based model of it. Where it's interesting, of course, is that we're trying to push the frontier of physics to regions where we don't know what the answer is. So it's this interplay between saying, ah, oh, I know a bit of physics, but this other bit that I don't know, and how do we work together? And I think that's another area where machine learning and physics and statistics will come together. And you know, if you think about it, it's amazing how well you can do with classification problems with using pixels and pretending that the world is actually two-dimensional, right? All of the stuff that we saw Alex talk about is pretending that the world is two-dimensional, but we know the physics of the real world. So I think what's gonna happen is that you'll see a lot of people building three-dimensional physics into their classification algorithm. And then it will say, oh, this is a cat from this angle, and I think in three dimensions, this is what it would actually look like. And capsule networks are sort of a first step towards that. And then I think things will be much more impressive. You know? Like there's an amazing video of dance pose where they build a wireframe that, that dance, that just on top of a person dancing, you know, capturing all of the joint movements, etc. It's really incredible. From that, they can generate fake dancing people. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry, Lisa. Yeah, how far can we predict into the future? Yeah. Um, so I was at Google last year, and, and we, we held a workshop, and so I, uh, I ran a poll, which is, how long do you think it will be before we have human-level artificial intelligence? And so the, the numbers range from five years to more than 100, and it was just uniformly distributed between you know, infinity and five years. The, the average was 25. The median was 25. So the truth is, like, if we have human-level AI in 10 years, then in 11 years we have AI that's 100 times smarter than human. So I think it's, comp it's, what would we do with AI that's 100 times smarter than us? Like, I literally cannot comprehend the question. It's like, it's like being a dog. There's never been a human, and suddenly there's humans everywhere, right? Uh, the dogs are saying, you know, how can we turn this to our advantage? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so if, if human-level AI is, uh, is 100 years away, then I think you can predict fairly well. If human level AI is 25 years away, I have no idea what it even means. Almost, I think these are very important questions that we need to discuss as a society, though, because even if we don't get human level AI, there's probably going to be 25% job losses in the next 20 years from the middle class. So, what does it mean to be in a capitalist?